This is the village of Humshof in the Tyne Valley, about 20 miles west of Newcastle. It's quite a pretty village, as you can see. Lots and lots of pretty cottages with nice gardens. An attractive church, not very old, but nice. The pub, that looks nice too. Yep, it is very, very attractive, but uh, it's very quiet, isn't it? Do you think anybody actually lives here? You will have realised that this is Hum's Hot Village Hall. And these ladies here are the ladies of the local WI who are engaged in an orgy of tea and cakes because they love their scrumptious goodies, the WI ladies. I'll tell you, you can't beat the food at a women's institute meeting. Forty women all showing off with their favourite food. Do you know, the food is just delicious. I bet you couldn't get quality like this from a professional caterer. There are flans that melt in your mouth. Mm. Oh, it's cake to die for. Oh. Actually, it's cake to die of. <laughs> I shouldn't have been here tonight. I've been cheating. What happened was this. A little while ago, I came here to give a talk to those very ladies who just left, and I had such a lovely time that the idea suddenly came to me to make a programme about village halls, and where better to kick it off than in the place of its birth. So anyway, this is a typical village hall. Uh, in the sense that, and I want you to pay close attention to my reasoning here, in the sense that it is a hall and it's in a village. But there are lots of other reasons that make it typical too. Village and church halls nearly always have a stage with old-fashioned curtains. I suppose they tend to be a bit sad because big curtains must cost a lot of money and they don't get replaced very often. But sad or not, though, when I was a little boy, performing in church concerts on stages like this was the absolute limit of my sophistication. I have been in Sunday school concerts and youth club reviews and Lord knows what else. I have forgotten more lines on stages like this than... Uh, oh, I've forgotten how many. Oh, I've forgotten how many I've forgotten. Under the stage, there's often a door that leads down to dusty and spidery depths. Only men were allowed down there, though, to retrieve manly things like the trestle tables. Women were in the kitchen, of course, making clanking noises while the show was going on, heating up boilers and clashing cups, laughing a lot, and wielding mighty teapots like these. It is my contention that only church halls and village halls have got teapots like this. I bet you haven't got one in your kitchen. It seems to me that it requires a special skill possessed only by village ladies to manage a teapot like this. Only recently I witnessed a scene of potential horror where a teapot bearer tripped and flew in a more or less horizontal manner across the room while ladies leapt backwards, clutching their frocks and fairy cakes. If Humshof Village Hall is typical of many such places from the inside, it's very much what you'd expect on the outside as well. Not that posh and not that old. It's not great architecture, but it's a nice enough building with its rock-cut walls and its metal-framed windows. It looks just what it is, a good quality memorial hall of the 1920s. There must be thousands like it all over the north. Not all that impressive. There. I have a particular weakness for wooden village halls, like big garden sheds. They're usually the humblest, the cheapest, the most basic, 
but they look so pretty with their faded wood and paintwork and their little old-fashioned windows. For some reason, I always think of the 1920s when I see them. And of all the ones that I've given talks in, and there have been loads and loads of them, this has been my favourite. It was another WI meeting, or Pie Fest, as I like to call them, and it's a tarsad right up high in the hills of the North Tyne Valley. It was the middle of winter when I was here, and bitterly cold and dark. Oh, there are no street lights here, and very few houses. But inside, oh, oh, inside it was lovely. It was all cosy and warm. Well, it still is, though it's been done up a bit since I was here, but it's still little and sweet and prettily painted, and I still love it. On the hall, you don't realise this already, but if you're looking for posh, don't look at village halls, because you'll only be disappointed. But just occasionally you come across one with a bit more architectural oomph. Lanacos Priory, just outside Brampton in Cumbria, was founded by Augustinian canons in 1166. But most of what you can see here dates from a little bit after that time, from the early 1200s, and very beautiful it is. This is the early English period of Gothic architecture in its most northern style, very simple with long lancet windows and not a lot of extra decoration. A glorious west door, again very simple but very elegant. A nice little row of blank arcading above the door, and high up in the gable, an extraordinarily beautiful 13th century statue of the Virgin Mary. It's a beautiful and a serene piece of architecture. But it doesn't seem to have been all of that serene here in the Middle Ages, because we're only a few miles from the Scottish border here, and this place was attacked on innumerable occasions, which is why the remains include two defensive towers. This one was the Priory Guest House. King Edward I is supposed to have stayed here a couple of times in the 13th century. This tower acted as the Prior's lodging, but also as a place of refuge when the monastery was attacked. But for all the danger, this place wasn't finally destroyed by the enemy, by the Scots, but by the government, by Henry VIII, who closed down the monasteries and gave this particular one to a local family called the Dakers, a chap called Sir Thomas Dacre, who converted part of it into a house for himself, and a very nice job he made of it too, nice new windows. This was his great hall, which has got a 16th century roof, it's called a king post roof. The king post is the vertical one. The angled beams which give it extra strength are called raking struts, and the bottom one is called a tie beam, so that's nice too, but now look at this. I think that these wall paintings have always been known, but I'm also sure that they were barely visible, incredibly faded. But they've just been revived, exposed with grants from the Heritage Lottery Fund and assorted other agencies to reveal tremendously rare 16th century wall paintings in a church hall. Because that's where we are now, the Dacre Hall, Lanacos Village Hall. When I was a little boy, I came here once with my mum, who was given a talk to the Mother's Union, and being but a child, I didn't know that it was a historic building. I just sat there mortified with embarrassment because my mum was giving a talk. And here I am again, sitting suitably mortified. We have a tendency to think that there was a golden age of the English village, an oldie wordy time when apple cheeked villagers sat on oldie wordy benches outside oldie wordy pubs smoking ruminative pipes long into the summer night, or when the whole community gathered for festive occasions on the village green to dance pastoral dances and drink wholesome ale, when romance was innocent and pure and even punishment was picturesque and environmentally sound. I don't know if it was ever like that, but if it was, there was certainly nowhere to go when it rained, because no English village in the distant past, as far as I know, ever had a place where ordinary people could get together as a community and have fun. 
This is Rommelkirk, which is a beautiful village in Upper Teesdale. You've seen it's green, still with the village stocks for village naughty doers. But apart from that, it's got a fine, a very fine medieval church. A couple of beautiful pubs, lots and lots of gorgeous cottages. This is an absolutely classic English village. But what it didn't have for most of its history was a village hall. Like almost all villages in the country, it had no community facilities at all until Victorian times. Until 1887, in fact, when it got this rather simple little building, which contains within it an opportunity for me to do something which I haven't done since I was a young man. Rommelkirk here in Upper Teesdale didn't get its snooker table in 1887. It had to wait until the 1920s for that. But it did get its first ever village hall. Interestingly, it wasn't built as a village hall in the sense that we think of them nowadays, but as a reading room. A place where the villagers could come and improve their minds by reading good books and Newspapers. Almost all of the oldest village halls weren't built as places for naughty, dissolute pleasures like snooker or indeed for Women's Institute bean feasts, but as places where the villagers could go to improve their minds. Teasdale here must have had lots of people who needed to have their minds improved. Indeed, there are those who suggest that it still has, because lots of the villages round here had improving facilities built in the 19th century. Reading rooms and literary institutes, and in particular, mechanics institutes. <laughs> this is the Witham Hall in Barnard Castle, County Durham which started life as a mechanics institute and is now, like most of the other mechanics institutes, a community hall of an unusually posh nature. Village halls, as we've already seen, aren't usually posh at all, but this one is a pretty spiffing bit of architecture in my opinion. It was built in the 1850s with money raised by public subscription. The Mechanics Institute movement, of which this is an excellent example, was founded by a chap called George Burbeck, who was a professor at Glasgow University early in the 19th century. For some reason, he was questioned on one occasion by a group of factory mechanics about the machines that they were building, so he decided to give a course of free lectures on the mechanical arts. I think he expected a couple of takers, but in the event, 500 men turned up. He was impressed by their attitude and one thing, as they say, led to another and in 1821 the first Mechanics Institute was founded in Edinburgh. This one in Barnet Castle was founded in 1832 by Henry Witham, local posh chap who'd been a geologist in Edinburgh. He died in 1844 and this new hall was built in his memory. What went on in here was education for the working man. There were essentially self-help night schools for working people, a function which has been taken over nowadays by the state. So buildings like this have found new uses for themselves, an amazing range of new uses. They hold art exhibitions in this lovely little room on the ground floor. There are all sorts of rooms for craft classes and seminars and all sorts of worthy stuff. The main hall has masses going on too. There's carpet bowls obviously, but they also manage to fit in things like pilates and ballet, badminton, keep fit and play groups. According to the blurb, the hall has one of the finest sprung wood floors in the northeast and is perfect for dancing on. Which makes one wonder why I remain so totally useless at it. 
And in this office lives the administrator who has a computer upon which I wish to show you a remarkable thing. Because when I was researching this program, I typed the words village halls into a search engine and I came up immediately with loads and loads of hits. Stuff about how to run village halls and how to fund them. And loads of stuff about different places. This was Teasdale, for example. Loads of stuff about Teasdale, including all of the stuff that I've been telling you about Witham. I found that if you typed in a particular area, like Lancashire for example, you got loads of other choices and you can choose a particular village. Arkham is a village I know in North Lancashire for example. You click on that and click into the site and immediately you've got all of the information you could possibly want. You know, anybody could write these scripts. I just pretend to be knowledgeable. But of course, it's not enough to see it on a screen. To see the virtual village hall in the virtual village, you've got to see the real thing. The website told me that the village has spectacular views across the Loon Valley to the Yorkshire Dales. But that's not the same thing as seeing it for myself. This isn't a big village, it's about 350 people, a few more if you include the outlying hamlets, but it's still got a shop and a garage and a pub, all signs that this is a pretty active community still. It's got a school all of its own, so this is a pretty thriving place. But none of that prepares you for the village hall. Is that a terrific piece of building or what? What a surprise to find something so cool and contemporary. It was only built in 2002, but isn't that exciting? It's utterly modern and yet it fits in beautifully in this village setting. And big, extraordinarily big for only 350 people. The entrance hall looks like a hotel reception. To me, there doesn't seem to be anything that it doesn't have. My wife would kill for a kitchen like this. And when you get into the main hall, well, it's huge and very modern, light and airy. No surprise then that it's so busy. Do you know there are at least 12 different groups meet here every week? There's the school, of course, Sunday school. There's badminton and line dancing. There's playgroup for the younger people, luncheon clubs for the older people. There's dance and there's craft clubs. Oh, and there's youth band. You can hire it for a wedding or a conference. Or you could just sit nice and quietly here in the conservatory, drinking in the view over Ingleborough. You see, there's been a revolution going on in the village halls of England. In fact, there's been more than one. There's been a revolution in funding. The Heritage Lottery Fund has made improvements possible in thousands of village halls. And the sort of conditions that they place upon getting grants mean that everything's accessible to the widest range of people. So Arkham's just one of loads of villages where the facilities have been revolutionised since the millennium. But the other revolution has been in attitudes. My mum was born in the Lake District in 1910 in a village called Thornthwaite, just outside Keswick. My impression is that when she was growing up there in the 20s and 30s, there was a really lively sense of community. There were dances in the village hall and bring and buy sales, all of the year-round festivities of village life. But by the time she got older, in the third quarter of the 20th century, nearly all of the houses in the village had been sold to second homers. Everybody had tellies and cars and could go to town for their entertainment, and the life of the village hall had become a thing of the past. That was something that happened all over the place, all over the country. But there's been another revolution taking place in the last 20 years, a revolution in attitudes to local community. The Millennium Commission did a survey recently and they found that 73% of people felt that they knew more about soap stars than about their neighbours. 
but people didn't like that and over 90% of people said that it was important to have a sense of community round about them and that we as a nation should be doing more to encourage that sense of community. That's where village halls come in. Gamblesby is a tiny village on the edge of the Pennines in Cumbria. By the beginning of this century, it had lost all of the facilities that it once had, including the village hall, which had closed down in 2002. Run down, cold, drafty and damp. Not a tempting prospect if you want a night out with the neighbours. The only heating was provided by overhead electric heaters, which had the effect of burning the top of your head and leaving your feet freezing and your pockets empty because they were exceedingly expensive to run. Time to call in the community, the Village Hall Trustees. They used a combination of grants from just about everywhere, all of the free local labour they could find, and anything that they could catch from the neighbours. They first of all gave the hall a revolutionary and hugely environmentally friendly ground source heat pump, which is buried two metres under the car park and provides for a fraction of the original cost all of the hall's heating needs. Now that all happened in 2004 and since then they've gone on to add a new efficient and properly insulated extension. They've added a wind turbine which provides enough electricity to drive the pump, heat the hall's water, light the place and still have enough left over to sell the surplus to the national grid. I hope I'm not being patronising here but when I first started to think about this subject I really didn't expect to find all of this energy and adventure here in the villages of the north. I still thought of them as rural backwaters, not hotbeds of community and environmental action. What a fool I was.